The Matrix rebooted. It's gonna happen. Hold on to your butts. Here's what they should do. Here's some bullshit they're probably gonna do. All right, in part one, we're doing biggest flaws in the originals. Part two, how to fix those flaws. Part three, uh, some screenwriting tips, lessons we can learn, what worked in the originals, what didn't work, what can we apply to our uh, new version. And part four, my pitch, Matrix rebooted. What's wrong with the originals? Number one, they make no goddamn sense. In order to change a human being into this. Hey, you guys know that uh, batteries just store electricity? So the evil computers need humans in order to power. It's the power plant. P people and goo pods create electricity. Okay, cool idea there. Even if I give you that, like, putting a large mammal in a tub of goo would generate a bunch of electricity, why not just use, like, a whale or a cow or something? Like, why does it have to be humans? I don't understand that. Is this body heat? And then they're saying something about, like, maybe it's brain electricity. The human body generates more bioelectricity than a 120-volt battery and over 25,000 BTUs of body heat. I mean, in the fourth one, it's literally cuck edging is the electricity. So why not just like a bunch of chimpanzees? Are you telling me SeaWorld is a power plant? What are they feeding the humans? Because now we eat food and that food, if it's a meat, doesn't matter. That came from plants. Ultimately it's plants. Ultimately it comes from the sun. It's solar power. We eat solar power for breakfast. I don't know if you knew that, but we do. There is no sun. It's all blocked out. There's no solar power. So what is the energy they're using to make the food for the people? I don't understand that. I don't think they ever established that. The only thing we ever see them actually feed the people is ground up dead people. And it's like, okay, we're just... So all you gotta do is whatever you're feeding the people, just use that to make uh, electricity. Like you could use plants and like burn them. They don't have plants. I don't know what the, I don't know. Geothermal. Humans as a power plant makes no fucking sense, people. Even if we buy, okay, humans are a power source, fine. Why not just keep them in a coma? They have to be like conscious. And then so if you want to say, oh, it's like mental power electricity from harvesting brains. Okay, fine. Let's go, let's say it's that, that it's human brain power was what we're harvesting. It's more than just body heat and whatever. All right, I have, a, I have an idea. Um, instead of making them be set in a time period where there's computers and they're all like, I'm a hacker. Set it in like fucking medieval times, right? You, you give Neo a red pill and he wakes up and Morpheus is like, hey, here's uh, all this information. And he's like, oh my God, you made lights move, a heretic. And then he like stones Trinity to death for like wearing cloth with two fabrics or something. O-M-G. So they could have set this matrix at like any point in history, except for the last like 50 years. And these people would not have any hacking ability whatsoever. They wouldn't know what the hell to do. Like fucking robots come after them in the real world if they wake up and they'd be like, what is a robot? I don't, I'm so confused. But you know what would be a good time? How about like right when everyone's preparing for the Y2K bug and they're all like, we just saw the net with Sandra Bullock. Seriously, the AI have gone far, far out of their way to create a hacker training program to put their goo pod people in. Like, why? That'd be like if we made a power plant run by cow farts, which we should do. Uh, methane, bad greenhouse gas. So you have all the cows in there and we gotta harvest all their farts and we wanna keep them happy. So we put VR goggles on them, right? Okay, so they're happy, they're farting, we're harvesting the farts, great. And then someone decides, you know what we should put in the VR? Let's have them watch Animal Farm. Yeah, that's a good idea, let's do that. Also the cows speak English, I guess. Or we, we've translated Animal Farm into cow. Number two, in the Matrix, they break their own rules all the time. Oh, God damn it! This is my problem with all fantasy, superhero, magic, all this bullshit is they can just make up new rules whenever they feel like it and they don't have to be consistent about it. And they can do stuff like in the fourth movie, oh, we use time travel. And then in the subsequent three films, they just pretend time travel doesn't exist. Harry Potter, oh my God. I will give you a couple, three, I don't know, a few leaps in logic to set up your story world. You know, if it makes it more interesting. So like you're, if you die in the computer, in the matrix, you die in real life. Okay, that's dumb, but you set it up right away. All right, I'll give you that one. And then in the sequels, we're like, oh, and also Neo can make EMPs with his bare hands. It's like, what the fuck is this bullshit? Like the matrix is interesting because when they're in a computer, they can do cool shit because it's not real, right? Uh, and now you're in the real world doing supernatural shit also. So it's like, oh, we have 
VR cool things. Also, we have supernatural cool things. I'm not, no. Then later, Neo can just see, even though his eyes are destroyed, he can just see. Uh, he sees the code, he sees the Matrix code. Neo has fucking supernatural Wi-Fi. Like, I don't, you know, Jesus turned water into wine. Neo can turn bean burritos into fucking Wi-Fi. Okay, that's... That's a techno Jesus right there. Indian Jones, the first one, Christianity is true. We know that in the first Indiana Jones, the Ark of the Covenant melts people, right? Okay. In the third one, the last crusade, uh, the cup of Christ works, makes you immortal. Fine, it's a world where uh, Christianity is true. All right, Indiana Jones 4, aliens. And so, okay. Does that mean there was an alien Jesus that went to alien planet and like turned water into alien goo? I'm not gonna like four movies in and be like, oh, also aliens. Were there alien Nazis that discovered the alien Ark of the Covenant on the alien planet? And there's an alien Indiana Jones who rode on the outside of a submarine and you forgot that that happened? What? Idea for a movie. Aliana Jones and the Space Jesus of Doom. So Matrix, it's like cool, you can dodge bullets. You can do scorpion kicks, you can do cool shit. And then in the real world, EMPs, seeing code, even though he's blind. Uh, an agent could just upload a virus of himself into a human brain. What? Oh my God. Number three, Zion is lame. Oh, I fucking hate Zion. God damn it. Zion, beer me. Zion is cool in Matrix 1 because you don't ever see it. That's why it's, oh, it's, oh, the mythical city. If you live long enough, you might see it. And then in the sequels, they're like, oh, hey, we're doing a rave. Oh, there's politics that you don't care about. Oh, Morpheus's ex-girlfriend is now with this guy. Then there's this lady and she's worried about her boyfriend. Plus we've got mechs that are stupid. And oh, we're shooting, oh my God, oh, I fucking hate. Cave strawberries, God damn it. Old men like me don't bother with making points. There's no point. Is that why there are no young men on the council? Good point. The whole point is it's cool, you do cool action, you dodge bullets and come through awesome stuff and they're like, ah, oh, caves and machine guns. Like, I don't, I don't care. I don't want that. Stop. No way. It's all right. They need you. I need you. I missed you. I can tell. I was thinking. Everyone is here. Follow me. Number four. The ending is super lame. Oh, like, so Neo goes and meets a baby, a baby alien thing and then like makes a truce that doesn't make any sense. He's like, okay, all right, all right. So the whole point of this truce is that like Smith, so he was, he was an agent and now he's like a virus who's like taking over everything. They have a virus running out of control and they don't know how to turn it off. They can't just turn the matrix on and off real fast and then like do some, can't delete them. I don't know why, but Neo can destroy the virus. Why, how, I don't know. By punching, that's how, this is how antivirus software works. You punch a lot, okay, cool. So the AI makes this truce that Neo will go in and will defeat the virus. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, we'll let your city live. So he goes in and he stops the virus and then they could be like, eh, all right, we'll destroy the city anyway. Thanks for destroying the virus. Why would they keep the, like, and then in the movie, they're like, we're not like humans. We're better than humans. We keep our word. It's like, yeah, because if there's anything I know about machines, it's that they're um, trustworthy. And the way that Neo like stops this virus isn't any programming things. He, he They just punch each other a lot. Like is metaphorical punching. Also, why is only one Smith fighting him? Why all these other thousands of Smiths just stand there? What does that mean? I don't know. It's all just it's a metaphor for defragging your hard drive. I don't, I don't know. It's almost, but not quite, story about some old guy who doesn't really know how to use his computer has his computer hijacked by a hacker and then the hacker like blackmails him and is like, I'm gonna leak your nudes or your internet searches unless you pay me. And then he pays him and he's, he's just like blackmailing this old dude who doesn't know how to use his computer. That's kind of what it's like. Basically, Colonel Sanders is like, oh God, I got a virus. I don't know what to do. And he goes to a hacker and the hacker is like, I'll fix it for you, but you gotta like give me a whole bunch of shit. That's how they, they didn't plant the virus. Uh, that just happened. They just have, they just backed ass, ass backed into it. Back assed, what the fuck? Fall ass backwards. And if the trilogy isn't bad enough for you, the fourth one is, oh my God, it's so fucking bad. It ruins any uh, world building of like this whole story. 90 year old undead 3D printed back to life Neo uh, harvested for electricity from their cuck edging from Chad 
fucking Trinity, and, and then he gets out, and then he has to red pill Trinity, who's now twice undead. Who fucking cares about these characters anymore? God damn it! Like, oh, there's robots that are good now. Oh, God. you gave us space, Sukasaka, and Couch Flex, I'm in the wiki business. So Matrix is gonna get rebooted. The studio was holding out. They're like, well, we want the original stars back. We want the original, the, you know, the Wachowskis. Apparently, we're threatening to do it without them now. We, we've got the one with Keanu's back. Okay, that was. Look at this cool action they did with this 60 year old man. Awesome. So the studio is gonna be like, thanks. I give it five years. I'm calling it now. In five years, we're gonna get a reboot. And it should just be called Matrix Rebooted. I mean, this it's crazy they haven't already done that. They're gonna get Wachowskis and your bullshit. No, thank you. We're gonna find some, you know, J.J. Abrams probably, fucking goddammit. Just standard whatever, do our studio bullshit movie. New cast completely. I don't, you know, I don't think they'll bring anybody back. They might uh, bring back some of the new characters from the fourth one that are young, that aren't 60. I'm gonna say they won't. I'm gonna say it's totally new cast. I am Morpheus. And I have to find Neo. Part two, how do you fix all that bullshit? So number one, you fix the battery nonsense, which is pretty simple, okay? The AI, they're not very creative, right? They need help doing creative stuff. They can run a spreadsheet, but they're not creative or original. They can't think for themselves very well. This is why they have humans. This is why, not power. So this is why it's a giant simulation. You're training billions of people to be programmers and hackers and all this, because you need them to do programming for you. So you're tricking them. So what's Neo's day job? He's a programmer, he does programmer things. Secretly, he's actually working on the communication system used by the Sentinels, I don't know. Neo thinks he's working on a new iPhone app for dating, a new Tinder, some bullshit. And he's actually like working on the system that like has the people bang and create more people in the matrix and they're like goo pods. What would you call that? Tinder for goo pods? Goonder? Grinder for goo. What? He's like the sperm bank operator. Okay, so now they need the people. They need the blue pills in there working on their stuff. The hackers on the outside, Zion people, they're like hacking to get in, but it's blue pill people like Neo who are working at office jobs who are like stopping the hackers. The, uh, the machines now need the people. They need this creativity to counter the Zion hackers. So all the blue pill people trapped in the matrix actually not just like innocent bystanders who make body heat, they're helping. They're helping the bad guys and they don't know it. Like, okay. This could lead to some serious ethical dilemmas because you could have a crazy Zion general who's like, let's just nuke the Matrix and blow all those people up. They won't have their creative power anymore. We could get a better hacking attack or whatever. And they're like, okay, but you're talking about like murdering a billion people. And it's like, eh, they're blue pills. I don't know, who cares? And one of my ideas is don't just red pill and pull people out. Wake them up, but leave them in there so they can do sabotage. If you remember at the end of Matrix 1, Neo at the very end is like, I'm gonna show these people a world without you, a world without rules. And it's like, then he flies away. It's like, oh, he's gonna like show them. He's gonna demonstrate publicly that they're in a simulation and like wake up lots and lots of people and like, Okay, so this could be an interesting like perspective of like of normies who are like, what the fuck's going on? There's a dude who's like Superman, he's flying, like, are we in a simulation? What's... F One of the big things missing in the Matrix is the perspective of blue pills, of normal people. Uh, at the beginning of the Matrix 1 where Neo, like on his monitor, there's stuff about like international terrorist Morpheus does a thing and it's like, yeah, he's like, all these normies would be like, that's an international terrorist because they blow shit up and you know, oh, they're the bad guys. Could be very interesting to see their perspective and then like, this terrorist is making a lot of sense. Oh, I don't know. Uh, but we just ignore that perspective completely in the sequels so we can learn about cave strawberries. Hey, you turn up all my mom or what? This is my husband, Chad. Ideas are the new sexy. Number two, stick to the goddamn rules, all right? If in the Matrix, you dodge bullets, okay, we got it. In the real world, nothing supernatural. No EMPs, no seeing code when you're blind. Or do the Matrix within a Matrix thing. I mean, I came up with this theory in 2002. I don't know. I went and saw Matrix Reloaded at a midnight screening when I was a senior in high school. Maybe it was in the spring. I was maybe a junior in high school. And we had this theory. I didn't know we talked about it then before I ever read about it online. That you got the Matrix, which is like the real world in 99. You come out of that, you're in like Zion world. But actually that is another Matrix. And if you can wake up from that level, you're an, I don't know, who knows, on the moon and then it's aliens. It would explain a lot of things. I think after Reloaded, we were like, yeah, that's what's going on. Revolutions is gonna, okay. It's gonna be that they were in a Matrix within a Matrix. Because there's always clues like, 
Okay, Neo does an EMP with his bare hands in real life. He can then see code. There's a virus infecting a brain. Okay. A gift from one of the orphans. You said you'd understand. Those hovercraft, those definitely look realistic and totally real from real world, right? Look at this fucking... Yeah, that's that's a normal thing that happens in real life. So it could have been a big holy shit thing. They could have dropped this reveal in the third movie in the trilogy, like right when like Zion's getting destroyed or whatever. You're like, oh, there's no way out of this discovery that it's a matrix within a matrix and that just totally changes it and it's a big holy shit moment. A lot of people were uh, coming up with that theory. I wasn't, I wasn't special. I'm not a beautiful and unique snowflake. But instead, what'd we get? Neo goes and makes a truce with a baby. So either don't do the supernatural crap or Matrix within a Matrix and that's like, oh, that explains, okay. Number three, make the ending not terrible. One of the things I'd like to see is this fight over the minds of the people in the Matrix. There could be alternate versions of the Matrix. There could be like a steampunk Matrix in like the 1800s, but they have like weird mechanical computers because they still need their programmers and changing things up. Try hacking Western Union whilst my wenches perform fellatio on you as I hold a blunderbuss to your back. Instead of any of this cool stuff and like, oh, fighting over the minds, of, it's just, we get flying octopi that are terrible at their jobs, uh, fighting against machine gun mechs, which are pretty terrible at their jobs, Zion politics, and then a baby truce thing. Like, what if the AI decides to just like hold a city hostage and it's like, hey, you hacker people, we're gonna liquidate this city of 10 million people unless you give us Neo or something like that. And Neo's gonna be like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm good. You can kill those 10 million people. Okay, moral dilemmas, all right? Even if it means endangering everyone in this city. You know, humans, they have emotion. We don't have emotion. You seem particularly triggered right now. Can you tell me how it started? He texted me. Bad romance and hovercraft, that's what we got. And Jesus, baby Jesus face. It's no, it's ba a baby talking to electric Jesus who is blind. Baby and Jesus. All right, part three. Some lessons in screenwriting that I learned from rewatching the whole quadrilogy. Alternate title, random shit I noticed and wrote down. Uh, screenwriting tips, let's call it that. You ruined every suck my silky ass thing. In Matrix 1, the tone, the setting is so much different than in the sequels, all three of them. They do not pop in and out of Zion. You never go to Zion. Quiet. Think about in the sequels, how often they go up and down from Zion to the Matrix, whatever. There's like multiple hovercraft, there's meetings with multiple hovercraft and multiple captains of hovercraft. When you watch Matrix 1 again, you're like, okay, they got Neo, they pulled him out. Why don't they go back to Zion and train him at Zion? Like, why are they still out in this risky underground cavern place? Sentinels are hunting them. Why don't they just go back to Zion and be safe? And the answer is, they didn't have the budget. They were like, uh, we don't know what to do with this fantasy cave world. So in the Matrix 1, it's just them. It's just this one hovercraft, this one crew. No one's coming to help. You can't go down to Zion and have like an ease of tension. You're always being hunted by the Sentinels. Very tense, almost horror thriller thing. And then the sequels, you widen the cast. So you're now you're jumping around. Oh, Zion politics. Oh, mech thing. Oh, the Sentinels are doing anything. Oh, the, the fucking architects talking. It diffuses all the tension by jumping around all the time. Also in the sequels, they forget about this whole like exiting the Matrix. Like Matrix 1 is so obsessed with, oh shit, I have to get to an exit. Oh, that phone was destroyed. Now what? We've got to go six blocks. Agents are going to kill us. The sequels, like half the time, they don't even show you them getting in and out. It was like, they're like, yeah, we did it a couple of times in the first one. We're bored of that. It's like, this is the stuff that's good, man. It's like, Back to the Future, you do different stuff with it, but it's still about like the DeLorean and like we gotta get it up to 88 and we gotta get the plutonium or we gotta find a different power source. It'd be like if in Back to the Future, they just stopped making it about time travel by the third one. And it was just like Doc and Marty living in medieval times, not trying to do any time travel anymore. They're just like, just trying to live there and like make peace with Ben Affleck. So often this is like a limitation of a budget we can't show this Zion thing, so we just hint at it. And that works great, you know? It's just a mythical place. If you live long enough, you might see it. Then the sequels are like, ah, we'll be there in 20 minutes. What's the big deal? 
It's like in Jaws. They, Bruce the shark just wasn't, you know, he was pretty temperamental and he didn't. He was in his trailer banging whores all day. So they, he's just not in the movie very much. It works a lot better when you don't see the shark all the time. I'm going to lose some people here. I, I want to get rid of the one. I don't like it, okay? Neo being the one and the whole, like, Jesus complex and then he has superpowers. Oh, my God. In the first Matrix, the agents are super scary. Nobody has ever fought an agent and not been killed. And so when they're like fighting agents and just, they're not trying to kill agents, they're not trying to pull off heists. It's just, we just, an agent saw us, we need to get the fuck out. If we fight for 12 seconds, maybe I can get away. Other than that, we're gonna, you're gonna get murdered. This is, it's scary, it builds all this tension. And then it's like, well, now Neo's the one. And then the sequels, it's like, okay. Uh, let's throw a thousand Smiths at him with bowling pin noises. Okay. So the, him being the one, and now it's like a fully realized thing, really is terrible for the sequels. Now, it's probably because they weren't planning any sequels. Then I was like, now what the fuck do you do with him being the one? So like, if you're starting out from the standpoint of we made one, now what do we do? Okay, so they did some interesting things with Neo and like, oh, it's, this, you know, the like system of control. There's been multiple of the ones and the architect shit, all that stuff. I think it's fine. But if you're starting from scratch, don't do that. Don't do the one. Just make him be like the next powerful hacker guy they get out. Don't don't make him super power. Then it's just like the one. A is super lazy. It's ugh. Neo, the one. And then like Trinity. Oh my God. You must be the one because the Oracle said that I would love the one. And you're the one to me. It's like, this is the corniest fucking rom-com bullshit. What are you doing? I'm not a fan of the Oracle. <laughs> if she can see ahead in time, like five seconds, just cause she can like see the, everything in the matrix, a super advanced AI that knows the state of everything going on. Okay, you can see five seconds ahead. But her baking like, oh, you will do this. You will find the one or you'll fall in love with the one. It's like, she's like a tarot card reader, palm reader, like either. She's also supernatural and an AI. It's an AI that's supernatural, can see the future. And if they have AIs that can see the future, why the fuck are they like in a war? Like, oh my God. Or she's full of shit and our main characters are like falling for like astrology tarot card reading bullshit. And either way, it's dumb. She works in small doses in the first one and the stuff, you know, there is no spoon type stuff. And oh, if it'll really bake your noodle later. Okay, fine, a little, in the sequels, I thought she was pretty useless. The first hour of Matrix 1 is still solid gold. It's great. It holds up in so many ways. The tension, the atmosphere, the style, so many cool things, mysteries unraveling. Even that you know the mystery now, it's still great to watch and see Neo like, what the fuck? There's so many little what the fuck moments. Then there's these terrorists, but actually they're the good guys. But then there's, the, there's just so many ways it escalates and the uh, tracking device and his belly button is lips melt then you get to the matrix goo pod reveal like there's a lot of shit going on i don't think they ever get there again at any point in any of the remaining films and i just i just want more of that first hour of the matrix give me more of that then find like the second half of matrix one is still good the final sequence is great i don't really care for the love story and you must be the one because i love you I don't know, okay and i want more of that and i don't feel like any of the sequels have ever delivered on any of this so Cut to um, Hollywood. Somebody's doing coke talking about we need to get J.J. Abrams' kid to do a sequel and let's, how do we reboot this? And it's like, all right, Matrix 1, we're doing that. We're not doing this fucking Jesus baby alien face bullshit. We're not doing KFC vis-a-vis uh, -vis bullshit. We're not doing cuck edging bullshit. God, the sequel's abandoned this great setting and this world and the, like, you gotta get to the payphone, you gotta exit, the agents are super scary. They abandon this fucking like Zion politics and cave strawberries and oh we go we just go back and forth between the Matrix and Zion Zip, snip snap snip snap. Each line of the program creating a new effect, just like poetry. The truth is we are completely. I've never liked the cipher. Uh, Joe Pantoliano betrayal. So he wants to go back into the Matrix and be an important person and he's staged. Okay. So he could just like go into a training program, the construct or whatever. He can go into a simulation that's not the Matrix and eat all the steak he wants and never get full uh, and just do that all fucking day or do whatever. He can do any kind of uh, flying, having sex with 400 supermodels at the same time. 
He can do any of those things. Granted, he knows that it's not real, but does that really matter? Because he's like, hey, ignorance is bliss. So you want to go plug back into the matrix where it's like, yeah, once a day you can eat steak and then you'll feel full. You could have way more fun, way more stuff to do in a VR world. Hey, by the way, you got to do some like hacking stuff. I mean, it's kind of interesting philosophically a little, but like mechanically it doesn't work. How does he make contact with agents and nobody notices? Nobody's the operator's not watching him do this. How did he make contact with them to begin with? Does he send them an email like, hey, by the way, can I betray? He texted me. Why would they uphold this truce with him if he like kills all the whole crew? Then they're like, we'll plug you back in the Matrix. And then they just kill him. Like what? <laughs> Why wouldn't they do that? So in Matrix 2, Bane, who's one of the cool hacker guys, he gets Agent Smith to like take him over virus wise. So then when Bane wakes up in the real world, he is Agent Smith. Okay, so a virus transmitted into the brain and took over his brain. So like, what are we saying? His brain didn't have good enough antivirus software. You know, like Norton didn't do that. Windows Defender. Oh, God damn it. Oh, I got a virus in my brain. This development is A, nonsense. I don't buy it. Okay. B, uh, it's like a goddamn superpower. This is like a super weapon that the machines have come up with, right? It, like, these machines are fighting these hacker people. If all these hacker people are logged in and then they're like, oh, we did this. And then like, now we control, we have viruses in the brains of all of the hacker people. Then they can just go back to Zion and destroy it. This feels like a super weapon Manhattan project kind of thing that they would develop uh, to take on Zion. And instead it's a power that Smith comes up with out of the blue at random and only uses once uh, for no reason. Like why do they need to do this to a bunch of the hacker people? Um, he just like half, just like falls ass backwards into like a brand new superpower. And no one seems to notice like how big of a deal this is. And maybe the baby octopus baby face thing that makes a truce with Neo, um, maybe it wouldn't be so mad about Smith taking over if Smith was like, hey, you know, I can just destroy Zion because like now I have this, this virus power to take over their brains. Maybe they can make a truce. Neo scooping, okay? Neo... Oh my god, scoop it, baby, scoop it. So what would happen if Neo doesn't do anything? They're going at 70 miles per hour. They would shoot over the semis. I guess there's an explosion underneath and maybe that would do something, but they're gonna fly over the semis at 70 and then like hit the pavement and then skid along the pavement, get some road rash. Neo flies in, I'm gonna say supersonic. I'm gonna say 700 miles per hour, something like that. He flies in, he grabs them and then pulls straight up vertical. Okay, which means that in a split second where he goes vertical, that 70 miles per hour stops dead. It's like hitting a brick wall at 70 miles per hour. And then he shoots him up straight. I don't know what speed that is. I'm gonna guesstimate 700 miles per hour. Cause it's, they're speeding up, slowing down time in there, you know, slow mo shit. So it's hard to say. So imagine you're wearing a harness and it snaps you back and you go zero to 20. That's gonna hurt. You might get a little whiplash, right? Now imagine it's zero to 40. Like that's serious whiplash. You're gonna like really mess your neck up. Now imagine a zero to a hundred, right? You get yanked zero to suddenly you're going hundred miles an hour that way. Or another way to put it, you're in a car, you got a seatbelt and you hit a brick wall at hundred miles an hour and just dead stop. You might die there. You might get a basal or skull fracture. Just your head is pulling forward and breaks this shit back here. That's how Dale Earnhardt died. Never forget, when Neo flies in and yanks them into this 90 degree, 700 mile per hour turn, A, they would be goo. B, I don't know how he's gripping them well enough. So really what would happen is he's grabbing like their clothes and he turns up and they would just suddenly be naked and flying straight forward with maybe their ball sacks torn open, something like that. Now, if he could really grab them, really, really, really good and strong, like, I don't know, neck, spinal cord. He gets a nice, a nice grab on the spinal cord. He turns up and he's just holding two spinal cords dripping with blood while the rest of the corpses are flying f forward it. They'd be going 100 and then an upward ballistic arc, something like that. But he saves them from road rash. Oh, that's nice. When he does it to Trinity, he's going faster. I think Mach 2 or something. They, they show him going and this like his wake is pulling like cars and shit behind him. It's like, how fast is he going? Uh, it's real fast. You see her falling and the agent falling behind her and then Neo rips her out and then he hits this car and like destroys this car. Just compare, like the agent hits this car. There are crumple zones. It takes like, you know, maybe a quarter second or a tenth of a second or something. It's some amount of time between initial deceleration and like stopping. 
And so what are they falling at? I don't know, 50 miles an hour. So they're like, just look at the way he stops and then compare that to the way she accelerates like that. There's no magic to someone grabbing you. You're still decelerating, right? It's still hitting a brick wall at 50 miles an hour. So like her vertical velocity stops dead. Instead of having crumple zone areas, she just hits his arms and they'd be like steel girders that have no give. So just vertical velocity goes to zero instantly. And then she's accelerated this way, like uh, Mach 2. I don't know, it's fucking insane. Would just completely kill her immediately. She's goo. He's flying away like just a spray of goo. It's like a it's like a duck going into an engine. So Neo has some kind of magic ability to cushion this, and I don't know how that works. Maybe he's made out of marshmallows. He's a supersonic marshmallow man. I don't know. Uh, cut to Iron Man. Okay, Iron Man is not a superhero. He's a dude with money and he's got like a cool suit that's armored, right? But he does shit like he's going 140 miles an hour and just like hits the ground and bounces. It's like, okay, so he's dead. Like, what? you're basically making a world where there's no fucking consequences. Like, we're supposed to worry that a, a super bad guy could like punch them to death or, you know, throw them off a building. Oh, that might kill them. And it's like, oh, but then he hits the ground at 140 miles an hour and is fine. Because he's armored, I guess. I mean, he's got a couple bruises. Oh, we're supposed to like really worry about this. Uh, you know what's not covered in armor? Uh, his brain, okay, which is gonna impact the inside of his skull and his whole like snarky sense of humor is gonna be turned into a pate that like oozes out of his ears. I'm supposed to care a whole lot that Trinity might hit the ground at like 40 miles an hour or that this one bullet hits her in the transverse colon. Oh no, the damage to her colon and maybe her pancreas. I'm really worried about that. And then Neo tackles her at super sonic speeds uh, and turns her to goo. But that's fine, you know. Just imagine all the frenulums in your body tearing in half, like that's... We don't use that word in here. This is what 67 G's does to a Formula One car, which is a meticulously engineered device designed to like withstand these kinds of forces. Uh, 67 G's does that. Neo's hitting Trinity with like 10,000 G's. Oh, but it's fine. Uh, he can fix her transverse colon by putting his green Japanese hand inside her. Oh, I feel so much tension about this. So blinding your main character, like Neo gets his eyes destroyed. That could be interesting. Like blinding, maiming a main character, like granted he can go in the matrix, he can see there. This could be interesting. Oh, just kidding, he can see anyway. Oh, that's great, thanks. So now there's even less consequences. Like there's one thing that like, you can't even hurt him in the matrix. Now when he's in the real world, his eyes are destroyed and it's like, oh, but I can still see the green coat everywhere. It's like, so now like, there's zero consequences to anything. He could, I, you know, he could fall down a mine shaft or something and then they'd be like, oh, he did an EMP and did a magnetic thing and he stopped his fall. I don't know, you can make up any fucking bullshit. Tension matters. If I don't believe that anything bad can happen to these people, I don't give a shit. And then when the only way characters ever die is when they make some Grand sacrifice that has 40 minutes of buildup. We all know it's gonna happen. I don't feel any tension for that either. Mechs are stupid. Holy shit, these are dumb. Okay, there's a giant obvious weak spot, which is the meat puppet in the middle that's completely unarmored. The people are just like out in the open. They're like barely protected at all. It's like, why don't you enclose them in armor? Better yet, have them be wirelessly controlled. Their people are plugged into a construct VR thing in a bunker and they control the mechs remotely. You can do that. You can have robots just control the mechs. I don't know. Why is there a totally exposed meat puppet out in front? This makes no sense. Sentinels are terrible. Oh my, they're so bad at combat. Why don't they have guns? They are only like melee weapons that have to fly and get there. And it's like, okay, we got a hole in the ceiling. We're gonna send in millions of melee weapons that just have to go through a millions of bullets flying up at them. A, they should have guns or rockets or bombs or something. There's one part in one of the sequels where they like spin and throw a bomb and it's like one time. It's like, why don't they have guns? So when they open that hole down into the Zion dock or whatever it is, uh, they can just pump it full of carbon monoxide, kill the Zion the way you kill a raccoon in the crawl space. They can just like pour gasoline down there and just like, turn this place into like a fuel air bomb. They can just drop bombs down there. Like what are you doing throwing like these delicate robot melee weapons in there for them to be slaughtered? Drop bombs down there, what are you doing? Zion, you would think would have a lot of EMPs. Like every big room, big area, port, the, the docks, whatever, they'd have a big EMP, two EMPs. You know, you have a backup. And the Sentinels get an EMP. They get to the next part, EMP. 
you just have EMPs everywhere. But apparently the EMPs are only on the hovercraft. And then you send the hovercraft out to fight, they all get destroyed, and now you have no fucking EMPs. And so you have to have this race with any, like, why don't you have any of this like base there? This makes no sense. They love this line in the sequels in two and three. Some things never change and some things do. It's not at all clever or interesting or philosophical, but they fucking love this, this back and forth. They do it like three times. I don't get it. It's really dumb. Stop doing that. I don't understand the big fight at the end and they're in the rain and they're just punching and it's metaphorically about virus software, antivirus software. Why aren't all the other Smiths fighting? I don't know. It's just metaphorical Kung Fu that means nothing. It's a metaphor of capitalist exploitation. So keys in my dumb trilogy. I don't want superpowers. I don't want EMPs and supernatural shit in the real world. Unless you're gonna do a Matrix within a Matrix thing. Okay. I don't want the one with like mega superpowers in the Matrix. I want something like Matrix Zero. So think about the original Matrix. You got this whole crew, Morpheus, Trinity, Cypher, uh, Mouse, Apoc, Switch. I want to see a crew like that doing cool missions and stuff, trying to pull people out, things like that. But none of them is the one. They're scared of agents. They got to get out of the mate. Oh, we got to get to an exit. Sentinels are coming. That setting, okay? Not cave strawberries and Zion mechs and Jesus baby face shit. Uh, uh, uh. Matrix Zero. I'm, I want to see that. It's funny. I rewatched um, Hackers, the movie, the 1995 film Hackers. Here's my theory. The Wachowskis saw Hackers and were like, let's do that, but cooler. Because there's a lot of similarities, so let me get into those. Hackers really nails the uh, how do you do fellow kids vibe because it's all these like 23 year old actors pretending to be high schoolers. Johnny Lee Miller, the main character, slash Zero Cool, slash what's his later uh, crash override. He's got multiple hacker aliases. Anyway, he goes to a new high school and like every one of those high school is a hacker. It's just all the kids these days are hackers. Uh, everyone's on rollerblades for some reason and they are just super cool kids. It's clearly marketed at like teenagers, but it's pretty similar to The Matrix. There's like all these people with hacker aliases and they hang out in like raves and shit and they dress really cool and punk and cyberpunk shit. They would all be total dorks, be super pale and nerdy and virgins and living in their basements. And they do a good job of showing up. They're like, they all live with their mom. Their mom's like, get off the computer. Uh, yeah, hold on, hold on, mom. Hold on one second. Open the door, Joseph. Uh, yeah. This is like an Angelina Jolie is supposed to be like a nerd who's sitting on her computer all day. It's like, uh, you don't believe any of this. Neo Yabai is like, he's pale and kind of like, hey, okay. He's not like some super out of shape, fat, pimpled nerd, but like. What truth? There is no truth. Repeatedly, like the FBI or Secret Service, just like swarms of agents just arrest them. This happens like six times. So it makes it feel like agents are just out there all the time looking for these hackers and it's the world against them. And it's like, the Matrix was like, let's just do that. Like, but they can just take over bodies. So they'll just be everywhere. Come on, time for school. Come on. Secret Service, go! Deja vu. Ray Sanchez, you're under arrest under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. Now go they're obsessed with pay phones, which makes sense because phone freaking was a thing. It was basically hackers, real life hackers figured out that like you pick up a pay phone or really any phone, but you pick up a phone and it's like, how does information sent on this? So you just play some noises in there. If you play the right noises, you can tell a pay phone like I paid the money. Let me do a thing because it's just sounds. The first minute. With the right sounds, you could manipulate phone networks. You could like connect yourself to the White House and dial internationally for free. And so they had like devices to do this. It's called phone freaking, real thing. And hackers are like obsessed with doing this. And then in the Matrix, they use pay phones as like their exits. And it's like, okay, this is like a, we're taking this real life thing and like heightened reality to it. But it's like, yeah, it's not just made out of whole cloth. So whenever the movie is maybe gonna get boring, agents show up and then they have to rollerblade away. And <laughs> Kind of similar with just uh, we got to run away. There's parts in both Hackers and The Matrix where like an agent or somebody's like got all the files and it's like, oh, we've been watching you. Basically, Hackers has the equivalent scene as in The Matrix 1 when Agent Smith goes to Neo and is like, and you help your landlady take out her garbage. I think the big difference between The Matrix and Hackers is A, they're like, don't make them teenagers. This is cringy as fuck. And B, the hacking scenes and hackers are like super heightened reality, like 
an insane, surreal, abstract version of what hacking is, which would just be nerds sitting on a computer typing and would be super boring to watch. And yet lots of movies have done it. And even then, it's not great. I think makers of The Matrix probably saw that and they're like, you can't go up from here. You can't make it even more abstract than this. I don't know what else to do hacking wise. You can't elevate this anymore. This is already insane. Let's just do badass kung fu. Gun fu, dodging bullets. It's all a metaphor for hacking, I guess. The Matrix is basically a hard reboot of hackers. It really, it's so similar in so many ways. It's so goofy in 90s though. Both of them have a massive attack song, yeah. And both of them have this moment where you meet a hacker and they reveal their hacker alias. And you go, oh, you're the one who did cool hack whatever. And they go, yeah. And they're like, oh, that's weird. I always thought you were a guy. Uh, Neo says the Trinity. And then hackers, they say to crash override. Oh, I always thought you were black. Because you know that stereotype that all hackers are black. And then they made Swordfish, which was just um, the Matrix, but uh, less realistic. <laughs> You know what? You know what the Matrix needs? More blowjobs during hacking scenes. Now, I have been told that the best crackers in the world can do this in 60 minutes. I need someone who can do it in 60 seconds. Go! Get up, get up, get up! 55. Get on with it. What the hell is this? Matrix rebooted, here's my pitch. Okay, partially this is me going, this would be a good idea, this would be an interesting, this is what I would want to see in a reboot. Hollywood, pay me, I'll write your reboot for you. And part of this is me being a cynical asshole, saying this is the dumb shit they'll do, okay? So if you don't like a particular part, that's me saying, that's the dumb shit they'll do. If you do like it, that's me saying, oh, that's my idea and it's pretty cool, got it? I'm always right. This is the Different iteration of the Matrix. We were talking Matrix Zero, right? The crew of Morpheus and Trinity, whatever. Okay, Matrix Zero, prequel. We're not in the one territory. We're not into like end of the world Zion under attacks show yet. What we're talking about is here's a crew, here's a hovercraft. They got a mission. Let's, let's see how this mission plays out. They're not going to find the one or any of that bullshit. This iteration of the Matrix, when is it? Is it 1999 again? No, I'm gonna go 88, all right? Late 80s, that's prime nostalgia. So we're set in 1988. Everyone's wearing neon and spandex and big hair. And maybe, okay, maybe by the time you reboot this in four or five years, maybe 80s nostalgia is over. We moved on to 90s nostalgia, that's fine. Now it's like a reboot of Hackers and you can do like rollerblading everywhere. You're All hacker right. enemy number one, man. Thank you, Mr. You're a boner. Key is you gotta do your nostalgia bullshit. Kills in a meeting. Nostalgia just fucking kills in a meeting. It's 8 a.m. and you're, you know, you're short on cocaine and you go, you know what would be badass? Rollerblades. Radical dude. The Matrix simulation is set in, let's say, 1989. But when is it in the Matrix grand storyline? Is it prequel? Is this before Morpheus Trinity, the one? Is it af well after, after Matrix 4? We're gonna hint. We're gonna put Easter eggs, a hint, and then we're gonna have the nerdy fanboys write about it online and do all that bullshit and argue about it for years until we finally reveal it maybe or we just say fuck off and don't 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 give an answer so we meet mackenzie davis alias mutiny she's a hacker okay got it nice I want to work for Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative and put missiles in space. Are you afraid to give me a straight answer? She works at a boring programming company. Everyone else there is like a stiff suit, but she's like, I don't know, 25, totally like punk rock, dresses badass, think like girl with a dragon tattoo. First act of the Matrix 1 stuff, like she's kind of like lonely, boring life. I'm gonna say she's like divorced has a kid but she doesn't get to see it because you know she's like punk rock hacker girl so the judges in 1989 super sexist and don't get it so she doesn't have custody how about this she has a hookup discovers after the hookup that he's married oh so she like hacks and in, into his life and like exposes it to his wife and like destroys his life gets some revenge we hear mentions maybe they talk about it at the water cooler at work a terrorist attack recently uh it's a different software company programmers were like murdered in this terrorist attack like three years ago. I don't know what the hell was that about. We hear bits and pieces about international terrorists, the new Morpheus, the new Trinity, whatever. So new Morpheus makes contact with Mutiny uh, and they get her woke, you know, the whole like you're living in a simulation and all that shit. But they don't give her the red pill and instead now you're woke. But guess what? We want you to stay in the Matrix. We want you to work for us. 
you're at this programming company, it's very important you stay there, stay under the radar, and at the right time, you put some malicious code, some backdoor virus, whatever, that'll help us. But why? What's going on? The AI, the machines are not creative, they're not original, which is why they have all these programmers, not for battery purposes. So the AI's got a new big project, they're building some giant super quantum computer that's gonna be creative and original. Once that's done, well, they won't need the programmers anymore. They can just liquidate the matrix, kill those billions of people, who cares about them? So they don't want that to happen, so their plan is to go blow up this quantum computer factory, whatever it is, and they need her help. Why? Because it's so heavily guarded, they can't get in to blow it up. Here's the plan, you're gonna inject this malicious code, it's gonna do a thing that kills the sentinels. It'll give us five minutes, we can sneak in, the sentinels are all dead, and we'll blow up the quantum computer. Four keys to screenwriting. Goal, right? You gotta destroy the quantum supercomputer. Uh, stakes, if you don't, they liquidate the matrix and a billion people die. Urgency, there's a time frame on this. This is gonna happen in this amount of time. Uh, and tension, goal, stakes, urgency, tension. If you rearrange those letters, you get guts. Guts of your script have gotta be good. Okay, tension is about like, do you believe that these people are in danger? Do you buy the danger? Back to mutiny, okay? She's working her day job. She's walking in the streets and then suddenly everybody, millions of people all just go limp. Like they've all been unplugged from the matrix. Whoa, what's going on? They all Did they all just die? Did the whole goo pod tower go down and they all, they're all dead? What's, what's happening? And then she wakes up. Oh, it was a nightmare. Or was it a glitch of the matrix? Or was it a premonition? I don't, I don't know. She wakes up and she's in her cube because she's working so hard. She's putting in this malicious backdoor code, but there's agents. Oh, there's FBI. Terrorists have infiltrated this company. She's trying to stay under the radar. So there's Agent Jones, maybe he's on to her, maybe he interrogates her, he's suspicious. He makes her mouth disappear, melt or whatever, but hey, let's, we gotta up the ante on that. Maybe he makes all her bones melt and she just like turns into a puddle. Then she wakes up and oh, was that a nightmare? Was it a glitch? Meanwhile, the new Morpheus, let's call him Orpheus. So meanwhile, Orpheus, he is sneaking into the Matrix to talk to her, make contact once in a while. When, gotta inject the code, how do we do it? When, when is the attack gonna be? Orpheus starts to fall in love with Mutiny. He would like to pull her out, but he can't need her in there. So he's gotta wait until she does the sabotage and that's done and then he can pull her out. But then at the same time, he's kind of distant about it. And she's like, why are you so distant? And he's like, well, you know, it's, it's, gotta keep my distance because you might die because we're kind of using it for the sabotage thing. Then there's a crazy Zion general who's like, hey, we could just like nuke that tower and kill 800,000 people. And then the machines won't have their creative original programmers to counter us. So we can do a big hack attack. More hacking. There should be more hacking in the matrix, okay? So they could do that and everyone's like, that's, but those are innocent people. And Orpheus, you're just saying that because your BDSM girlfriend is in there. So then they, I guess, come up with a plan. Like if you're fine, do your sabotage plan. If this doesn't work, I'm nuking the fucking tower. I'm, go, I'm going, killing 800,000 people, who cares? Back to mutiny, she's sneaking in. She's trying to plant her backdoor malicious code. Agents are there, they're watching. Okay, she gets the code in. That starts the ticking clock, 24 hours. The uh, Sentinels are gonna go down. They're gonna have their window of opportunity to go kill the quantum super creative computer. But now there's agents there. Agents are gonna get her. But then Orpheus shows up. Orpheus and the crew, they show up. We got cool action shit, dodging bullets, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't know how to dodge bullets and stuff. She's not the one or anything. She gets her first foray into a little bit of combat. Now, granted, we have agents who are the super agents that can dodge bullets. And then there's the blue pill law enforcement people who aren't agents aren't super powered, but they're like SWAT guys or they're cops and you know, they have guns, they're FBI. And so that she can fight them, not so much the agents. Orpheus goes and fights an agent, all right. The cool action shit, they get her out. Code is in, 24 hours, ticking clock. Okay, we'll have our attack. Let's get red pillar, let's extract her from the matrix. But then they discover in this whole escape, Agent Jones discovers, hey, you know what? Orpheus is really into this girl. And he figures out where she is physically in the like Matrix goo pod tower. And so they dispatch all these sentinels, they're guarding it. So they can't red pill extract her. They're holding her physical body hostage. And so they can threaten Orpheus and be like, hey, uh, tell us what the plan is or we're gonna kill her. We're gonna kill her right now in this goo pod. So now they have to keep her alive in the Matrix for like multiple hours. They're on the run, they're hiding. Because they can leave, but if they leave, she stays behind. It would be the sitting duck. They would capture her, torture her, and get all the information, right? This is something we haven't really seen. Staying in the Matrix. Tension. 
You gotta hide somewhere. Think about Matrix 1 where they're hiding the walls, right? Something like that. But ultimately now Sentinels are A, guarding her physical body, and B, they're looking for the uh, the hovercraft, which I'm gonna call the Nabopolassar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's dad. Oh, it's a new the prequel. Mm -hmm. So now the Sentinels are hunting down the hovercraft while they're holding Mutiny's body hostage. So the crew is like, hey, new Morpheus, like, we gotta get out of here. If we stay any longer, they're gonna kill all of us. We gotta go. And he's like, no, I'm in love with her. We have to stay and protect her. And they're like, no, we're gonna go. So you got a choice to make. You either pick Mutiny or you get a mutiny. Huh, what a line that'll be. Right, that will put that in the trailer. Oh, fuck yeah, Oh. So they mutiny, Morpheus is still in there, and they're like, we're driving the hovercraft away. Sentinels are gonna get us, we're, we're going. New Morpheus is still in there, so he's gotta get to an exit before they lose like Wi-Fi range on the, he has to leave her behind, but he's like, I'll, I will come back for you, uh, and he leaves. So now they're gone, they're hunt being hunted by Sentinels. We don't know, did they get away? We stay with mutiny. She doesn't know. Are they dead? Did they escape? Who knows? Now she's alone in the Matrix, hiding. Agents are after her. Oh, fuck. So we've got some sequence here. She's hiding. Maybe she has to beat the shit out of somebody. She starts, she's starting to learn how to do the cool combat. She didn't get a download and go, I know Kung Fu. We get an arc here of her figuring that shit out throughout the movie. And by the end, oh, she's doing scorpion kicks and doing all kinds of cool shit. She's on the run. Oh, agents are gonna grab her. Oh, and then she's grabbed. The bad guys have, ca have captured her. Oh, this is bad. Except they're not bad guys. Oh, plot twist. These are good guys. And maybe they're like surprising good guys. Maybe they're cops. Authority figure that you assume would be bad guys. But they grab her and it turns out they are also, they're woke, but still in the matrix. They're saboteurs. They're working for the Zion people. So they're hiding her. They help her like hide out for a while. We need you out here. Like, right now. Just check the loot files. Flip it. Bad software hit our network. It's overriding our data. Well, uh, our drivers are the users. Both. What? Hey, we need to quarantine all the unaffected machines. No! Anyone connected right now? No. It's vulnerable. Well, we have users online. We're not, the, we're staying up. It's starting on Parallax. Christ, this thing is fast. One of these uh, woke saboteurs is named Encryption. Okay, there's a cool name. And so now they realize, these woke saboteurs, that the agents know she was doing something. Now they don't know what she planted, malicious backdoor code. They don't know what it was. And she's like, oh, I'm super good. They're not gonna find it. The agents are just like, we're gonna do a whole system-wide wipe, go back a month on the whole, all the data. So whatever was planted in the last day, that's gonna be gone. So they're doing that and you're like, oh shit. So now the hovercraft are heading into the battle where all the Sentinels are gonna be ready for them. The Sentinels aren't gonna go down because the code's being wiped out. The woke saboteurs were stuck in the matrix. They gotta go sneak into the software company, which is now being like, on super guard they gotta sneak in they gotta put the code back in there and protect it they gotta do it at right at the right time so that they can't they can't just plant it and then leave and then the agents rewipe it or whatever they gotta do it right at the right time plant it hovercraft attack to sync up with it okay so we got a cool sequence i'm thinking something like terminator 2 and they hack into like cyberdyne systems and they gotta plant the bomb all, all that kind of shit. cool infiltration heisty type stuff oh we're gonna do this in time agent jones comes he grabs her oh shit this is all going horribly. He pulls her out, he starts interrogating her, and he shows her like video footage from real, the real world. He's like, you've never seen the real world. Well, this is the real world. And it shows the quantum computer, and then it shows all of the hovercraft attacking and just getting mowed down and destroyed. And right, here's all your friends, because you failed and they're all dying. So he's torturing her like Morpheus and Matrix One. He's trying to break her, get all the information he can on her. Who are the saboteurs? Who are all the woke people on the inside? What are their identities? Where were the exits? But then Agent Jones reveals something. He reveals, actually a couple years ago, Orpheus had a little thing, he fell in love with a programmer, someone just like you. He was using her just like you. Guess what happened to her? And then Mutiny's like, well, you discovered the sabotage, so you just blew up this whole programmer company, killed 300 programmers just to make sure you got the one saboteur because you guys are evil. And then Agent Jones is all like, those heroes of yours from Zion blew up that software company. So they killed 300 people, this whole programming company, all 300 innocent people, so they could do their big attack. And what was their big attack? Some war winning move, oh, that would be worth it. No, no, no. We had taken one of theirs into custody. One of you people. 
They traded 300 lives for that one they can hack out. Who was it? Oh, it was a person X who's on the crew that you've met. And we've since cracked down on that strategy. So they won't be planting one bomb and blowing up this one software company. They're gonna set off a nuclear device in the real world out there in the goo pods and they're gonna kill a few million people. They're gonna trade a whole city for this. Uh, and these are the people you call the good guys. And just imagine every last person you know, whether it's your daughter or your mother, all suddenly slumping over. So she's like getting bombarded with this. All oh, the revelation. Oh, Orpheus had a girl two years ago. He killed her on this attack. This is why he's not all that willing to open up to you. He's a little closed off because he knows he might have to sacrifice your life pretty soon. We're watching each show and they're like, hip, there's your friend. Oh, that was an Apple Pulaster. Oh, that one blew up. So you need this in the, your third act, you know, the low point where every, oh, we're gonna lose. Everything bad's gonna happen. That whole hacker is dead. This whole assault failed. This one lady is like totally disillusioned now. Uh, the AI supercomputer is gonna go online. They're not gonna need any of these hacker programmer people anymore. They're just gonna liquidate it and billions of people in the matrix are gonna be killed. But then they reveal the big twist. O.M. Gee. Here's what the real plan is. This was all just a misdirection, get you to look the wrong way. You guys aren't creative, you're dumb. And you saw this plan and went, oh, that's what they're doing. And I had no thought whatsoever that they, we would be smarter than that. This would be a trick. Then we get a montage -y thing, Ocean's Eleven-y, heist -y thing, where it's like the movie's kind of been lying to you about what's going on. So it's been showing you, oh, we're doing this hack to do this. And then it's like, secretly, we're infiltrating this over here. While you thought we were hacking to turn the Sentinels off to blow up the supercomputer, what we were really doing is hacking the AI supercomputer. We're hacking that thing, because when that thing goes online and gets plugged into the matrix, it's gonna have every goddamn admin power to do whatever it wants. And if we can hack that, once it's plugged in and turned on, it can do our bidding, do stuff we've programmed it to do. So we have this conversation with Jones is like smirking and like, ah, oh, we won, we oh, I killed all your friends. So she's explaining to him, and so what's gonna happen next is the AI is gonna turn on and it's gonna take over the matrix and it's gonna delete all of your files. All of the information you've stored, all of these files about who's a saboteur, who's woke, who's a blue pill, who's a good little boy, where are the exits we use? All that data you've collected, that's gone. And so then he's like, oh, I don't believe you. And then he like freezes in place and does like a reboot. And then when he comes back, he has no idea who she is or what's going on or like why he's interrogating her and he like flips through his files and they're just blank. Uh, do you need coffee? I'll go get you coffee. And he's like, oh yes, please. And thinks she's just like a secretary because he knows, doesn't know what's going on. So the agents have all been wiped. They don't know what's going on. But FBI, CIA people that are blue pills that are humans, they don't have their minds wiped, right? So they still like remember stuff. Maybe all the files they can open, physical papers, those are wiped, but this guy can remember her, right? So she escapes from the room where she was being interrogated, but there's like SWAT CIA guy. She's like in a bunker. So we get some cool action scenes. She's now kind of fully learning her scorpion kick bullshit. So we start with like a sneaky thing, some Jedi mind trick stuff on the agents. And then when it's like, oh, the, they're fighting back and she's maybe in trouble. That's when the crew, Orpheus and the gang shows up and they save her. While their files might've been wiped earlier, the agents see her and now they know like, oh, this girl, she's one of the saboteurs. So the very final sequence is them having to escape the CIA bunker. And then we get a helicopter plane, not a highway, whatever, giant cool chase. We gotta get to an exit. When they get to the exit, they got a red pillar real fast. The agents are closing in. We got a red pill you. Mirror goes down the throat. We're unplugging her from the matrix. We're gonna save her out of the goo pod, but mirror goes down the throat. Rage against the machine. There's your credits. We're done. Okay. Okay, let's talk sequel. I've got more ideas. Oh, fuck yeah. And who knows how many more? Here's a bullshit idea. You ready? Oh, the Oracle is speaking. Oh, what? Oh, the Oracle. We didn't talk about that in the first one. And Orpheus is told he's gonna find the one and he wants to go back in the main. Oh, he's always wants more. He wants to go back, find the one. God damn it, Orpheus. You always want more, more, more. They might as well call you Morpheus. <laughs> I am Morpheus. And I have to find Neo. And then Morpheus neglects mutiny. And so she, they break up and then she does an emotional haircut and changes her AOL screen name to Trinity. Oh, and this was all a backdoor prequel. We didn't, you didn't even know it. All right, so real idea. So we established very briefly in one that she has a daughter, right? So what's the deal there? She uh, got married at like 18, was like, you know, brainwashed fundamentalist type shit. Get married, have babies, be a mom type stuff. Gets a little woke about it and decides she doesn't want to do that and rebels from their homeschooling bullshit and wants to be a computer programmer and becomes kind of uh, punk rock programmer stuff. Total effing 
MILF. And divorced and all that, and there's nothing to do with her husband, and this evil, sexist judge is like, you have a weird haircut and wear leather, uh, you're a terrible mom, and took the custody away. So she's got like a daughter who's like six, who she never gets to see, is still in the Matrix. So now she's like, I gotta get my daughter out because the uh, the bad AI agents can always kill her or hold her hostage or threaten to do things to her. Maybe the agents are even like blackmailing her. With her. I don't know. So they got, we gotta break out my six-year-old daughter and the rest of the crew is like, I don't think she can handle, the six-year-old is too young to handle this reveal. Meanwhile, the machines are like winning the war. They're gonna attack Zion. But then we get information. There's a hacker somewhere who's working on some super secret government project who has some big information. He's a leaker, an Edward Snowden. He's somewhere deep in there. We get him out right at the end of movie two and we're losing the war. What is your information? And he's like, oh, this is not gonna save the world. Zion will fall. So what information did you have? Like, what use are you? Like, we thought you were saving Zion. And he's like, well, actually, here's what I know. Credits, oh, fuck you. We're not gonna tell you for three years. Go make your theories online, you fucking nerds. So this dude, this super cool uh, hidden programmer, give him a uh, give him a cool pro computery name like browser, MP3, Scuzzy. Call him Scuzzy. So anyway, Scuzzy. So they they break into the CIA place and they find Scuzzy. And she is this badass hacker, or whatever. And they red pill, and bring her out into the real world. And she wakes up at a goo pod. She's a dude, has a penis, and it's like, what the fuck? I'm a lady, I've been a lady my entire life, and I have a penis, and they're like, oh, you know, the mental projection. We get this whole transgender allegory thing, they did it sort of in the first one, I talked about it more in my other Matrix video. So, film three, three years later, you've been making your theories, we open on, not the cliffhanger, unrelated action scene. Zion is falling, everything's falling to shit, how are we gonna save this? And Scuzzy reveals we're in a matrix within a matrix. Oh, shocking. I mean, at this point, it's not clever anymore. It would have been like decently clever in the original trilogy and then they didn't do it. If you do the supernatural stuff, they'll really see it coming. So maybe if you're not doing supernatural stuff, they won't see it coming as much. They've got to figure out how to hack themselves back up another level to the real world. So we're following Mutiny. She wakes up in a goo pod in the real world. No one's there to help her out. She's got to find the daughter who's eight now. Finds her pod somewhere. I don't know how she finds it. She knew, she hacked and knew where it would be. Okay, fine. And pulls out the daughter. And so her and the daughter are now like in the rubble, in the middle of nowhere, underground. A few others on the crew have hacked their way out. Who knows where? And so she, just her and her daughter, they're hiding. They're running from Terminators, just going through tunnels. They find some abandoned city and they're like, this is where we start. A couple others find them from the crew. And then they're like, all right, we're going to start civilization over from here. It's just us. There's no one coming to help us. What do we call this city? We call it. Zion, plant the flag. And that's how you know it's a prequel. We did it, that's the very end, backdoor prequel. You didn't know it'd be a prequel. Bam, right there, right at the end. That's how you know. Or not, we can do something else. Last line of the trilogy, this is only the beginning. Oh my God. Uh, and then post credit scene, their Zion fell, like their portion of the Matrix. All those people are dead except for them. But they discover there are like other Matrixes, maybe other settings. There's one that's 1999. Oh, we've got to figure out how to hack our way into that Matrix and start telling these sleeping people that they're living in a fake simulation, right? We've got to incept Oh, Inception. We're gonna do Inceptions to tell them they're in a Matrix and oh, it's, a, it's an Inception prequel. And then Christopher Nolan sues us and we can't make any more movies. It kills our, our new backdoor trilogy reboot. And then uh, five years later, we just reboot this shit again anyway. So 2034, look forward to that. That's when they'll reboot the reboot after Christopher Nolan sued them. 2034, you're making a Matrix reboot. What year do you set it in? 2016. Yeah, that's your nostalgia bukkake year, I'm calling it. 2016 is when I started thinking that the universe is a simulation, but we this, this doesn't seem real anymore. I'm kind of on board with that, you know? You know in the Matrix when they're like, I'm gonna blow your mind. What you're living in is simulated reality. It's not real. They're like, what? That's a bad, oh, that's cool. If you were to tell me that right now, I'd be like, actually, this is a simulation. I'd be like, 
Wait, you're telling me Patrick Mahomes isn't real? Oh, fucking God damn it. Fuck God. And while I'm up on my soapbox, M&Ms. Why aren't they fuckable anymore? Oh, I need my M&Ms fuckable. I need my, my potato heads gendered and M&Ms fuckable. This world is going to shit. Who's a good little boy? So, she's butt. Okay. So she's out of the, and I have a penis. There is no poo.